right, so um, we're going to read chapters 12 to 13 today, um, but I am going to go ahead and give you a quick recap of chapters 9 through 11. Um, in chapters 9 through 11, Piper really tries to convince Moose to join her Alcatraz laundry service, which Moose really doesn't want to be a part of because he doesn't want to get in trouble. Moose and his mom have to go pick up Natalie at the Esther P. Marinoff school because things didn't work out there. Um, Natalie was a little bit too difficult for them. Um, we also learn about all the different things Natalie's mom has already done and tried to try to help and fix her, meaning trying to help her um, get past the special needs she has, which we know is not possible. And then Mr. Purdy recommends someone that Nat could work with um, in order to maybe help her get back into the SRP Marinoff school one day. All right, so chapters 12 to 13. So chapter 12. What about the electric chair? Tuesday, January 8th, 1935. The next morning seemed just like normal with Natalie watching the sunrise and then asking for lemon cake and my mom telling her she's a silly sweet pea and she can't have it. My mom has the little slip of paper Mr. Purdy gave her taped to the ice box door. Twice now she's asked my father how early he thinks she should call. I hurry past the Madamens on the way down to the boat for school. The fog's in and everything is gray. The foghorns bellow deep, low notes. First one end of the island, then the other. When I get to the Trixels, Teresa Madaman sticks her head out. Moose, can I come with you to school, I ask? Don't you have kindergarten at Kokoni's apartment? Teresa ducks her head back inside. Janet, I'm sorry. I have to go to school with Moose today, I hear her yell. Janet is B. Trixel's daughter. She is the same age as Teresa, but that is the one and only similarity they have. Mommy, Janet whines, Teresa's escaping again. Teresa, you can't go out. I told your mommy I'd look after you. You know that. I hear B. Trixel call. Ugh, Teresa groans. When is my mom getting back from the hospital? Having a baby couldn't possibly take this long. Do you think she went shopping? Teresa, B. Trixel calls. Come get me as soon as you get home, Teresa hisses and ducks back inside. When I get down to the Frank M. Cox, Piper is there waiting for me. I've been so caught up with Natalie, I forgot all about Piper's project, wondering how long before she brings it up. Boys first, she says. For a second, I hesitate, wondering if she has the gangplank booby-trapped. You know, Moose, I owe you an apology. She clatters across the gangplank behind me. For what? I ask, thinking of at least 300 things she could be apologizing for. I shouldn't have made you meet with my dad. I was just worried about your sister is all. But now that she's safely off the island, what do I say to this? She's got to know Nat's back. My father told everyone when we didn't show up for the party at the officer's club, right? Oh, I say. Oh, do you accept my apology or not? I accept your apology. Okay, Piper says. And I just wanted to explain something else, too. Helping me with the laundry isn't against the warden's rules. Here it comes. Oh, really? I say. You bet, she says. All right, let's ask your dad if it's okay, I say. Do you ask for permission to put on your underwear every morning? I'm just pointing out. I know exactly what you're pointing out, but no one here sticks to those stupid rules. You're the only one, Moose Flanagan. I shrug, and besides that, you'll be going back on your word. You told my dad you'd help me. You promised. Why should I help you? You treat me like something stuck on the bottom of your shoe. She smiles her most charming smile. I'll be nice now. No, you won't. Well, for a little while anyway. I laugh. It sneaks out of the corner of my mouth before I can stop it. She laughs too. An icy wind blows her hair off her shoulders and bites through my sweater. Let's go inside, she says. The boat pitches in the wake of a big ferry. I walk as if I've just learned how. Grasping the side of the door, I get myself in, inside the cabin where it's warm and steamy like hot chocolate. Piper's cheeks and the tip of her nose are rosy. Her long hair is blown every which way. The cabin is empty except for two guards and a scrawny little man in a suit. The scrawny man is handcuffed to one of the guards. The hair on the back of my neck stands up. Oh, that's Weasel, on his way to court, Piper says. What for? Another appeal, probably. He's one of those convicts that knows as much about the law as the lawyers do. They call them jailhouse lawyers. My dad says Weasel could convince the hens they're better off with a fox in charge, and then persuade the jury it was the chicken's best interest to eat them, or to be eaten. You know, Annie would never do this if 
if there was even the slightest chance she'd get in trouble for it. She's back to her plan now. You know, you know, you don't know Annie, and neither would Jimmy. Not if it were really against the rules, Piper says. I look at Weasel again. Forget it, Piper. What if I promise to be nice to your sister? Will you then? She asks. I'll think about it, I say. Well, think fast, because I'm doing it today. You'll be nice to Natalie no matter what. Promise, swear to God, she says. Never call her names. Never tell your dad stuff about her. Treat her really kind. Double swear to God. She holds her hand up like someone swearing her in. I stare at her right through her pretty brown eyes. There's something true in those eyes and something false, too. I nod. All right. You'll help? I suppose. I say, careful not to look at Weasel again. She rubs her hands together. We're in business. All you need to do is talk about Alcatraz. Get people in the right mood. You'll talk up the place, kind of like the warm-up, and I'll tell a few people and then let the word, the word spread. You must know some Alcatraz story, she says, as the boat's motor grinds beneath our feet. Inside her notebook, she shows me a small sign. Once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Get your clothes laundered by Al Capone and other world-famous public enemies. All clothes clean on Alcatraz at the only laundry facility in the world. Run by convicted felons during the notori or er, run by convicted felons, including the notorious Scarface Al and Machine Gun Kelly. Only costs five cents. I groan. Al Capone. It's only one little mention. She flashes her movie star smile. Nope, not doing it. She ignores this. We walk off the boat now, just behind Weasel and his guards. Follow my lead. Then when I leave, you take over. That's all you have to do. Talk. Did the warden say talking was against the rules, Moose Man? Talking about Capone is... Fine, don't talk about him then. He's not the only conv convict we have, you know. Jeepers. In Ms. Bimp's class, Piper moves into action. She motions me to the back of the room, where history books are stacked waist-high and a bunch of kids are copying answers for the last night's homework. My head stay, My head says don't follow her, but my feet walk back there. It's been a hard week, don't you think, Moose? Piper says to me so loud, she clearly means to be overheard. Did you see that shiv? What's a shiv? The girl asks. It's a dagger made of old silverware or carved out of a pot handle. The cons use them to stab each other or kill our dads, Piper says, though she barely looks at the girl, as if relaying this information is not her aim at all. I guess they found it in a library book, Piper says. Pages carved out in a knife shape. How do they find it? Do you know, Moose? I shrug. He knows, just doesn't want to tell. Piper glares at me, then slips away. So what happened? The girl demands. Somebody got stabbed, I guess, I say. What's the inside of the cell house look like? The fat kid asks. I've never been in there, I say, but my dad says the cells are like cages. Each one has a toilet, a sink, a bed, and a man. What about the electric chair? Anybody seen that? A girl wants to know. We don't have one, I answer. How about them firing squads? The fat kid is turned all the way around in his seat. This is the United States of America. We don't have firing squads, I explain. Yeah, that's not how we knock people off here. We fry them. I've read all about it. It's like this. A skinny kid shakes all over to demonstrate. What about the metal bracelets? You know, handcuffs and whoozy what's-its on their legs? I think maybe they just wear them for, you know, special occasions, I explain. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Piper talking to Dell. If he goes for this, everyone else will too. So, what happened, Scout asks. With the shiv in the library book, the girl seems proud of herself for knowing the word now. Like I said, somebody sliced up a guy, maybe killed him. I have no idea what I'm talking about now. That's the thing about the cell house library, I say. It's a high-risk operation. Really? A girl asks. Books are overdue, I explain. They lock you up. They have a special cell for it. Overdue library book cell. If it's more than 10 days overdue, they put you in the hole. Solitary confinement. No kidding? The fat kid asks. I can see him fingering his library book, which I'm guessing is past due. Oh yeah, I say. I'm starting to enjoy myself. And you should see what happens when you forget to say please. Bread and water for an entire week. Forget thank you, and it's even worse. Oh, come on, somebody says. Forget to wash your hands before supper. They slap you in leg irons. Prison is a bad place, I'm telling you. 
Scout is biting his lip, trying not to laugh. Most everyone knows I'm kidding, but one girl isn't too sure. On the other hand, I say, we have the politest felons in America. They say, please, thank you, pardon, and excuse me. If you're going to be robbed or murdered, you really want a polite guy to do it. Somebody who offers you a chair and some milk and cookies first. It's kind of like being shot by your grandmother. Who wouldn't prefer that? You must learn a lot living there, a skinny girl says. She's taking in my every word. Oh yeah, on weekends, there are special classes the cons teach us. You learn how to blow safes, make silencers, steer, steal cars. Thieves school, we call it. Homework's tough, though. Ever try to get a dead body in a rumble seat? Everyone laughs. They all know I'm kidding now. Then the bell rings. Thank God, because I'm out of stories. I look around and see Dell has disappeared. He comes back a few minutes later with his sweater on, but nothing but bare skin underneath. He rolls his shirt up and hands it to Piper, who is busy talking to Scout, sign in hand. When we are all settled in our seats, Miss Bimp starts rattling on about the importance of good posture and how no cultivated lady or gentleman would dream of slumping during oral reports the way certain members of this class are doing. She is just getting warmed up when the notes start appearing. How about tomorrow? One pencil rolled scrap of paper asks. No, only today, Piper writes back in her back slant cursive. How much for socks, another says. Two cents, Piper writes back. Will my blouse come back bloody? My mom would kill me if I ruined my blouse. No. Can you advance me a nickel? No. Please. The note comes back again. This time written in pencil grinding capital letters. No, Piper scribbles mercil mercilessly. When class ends, two lines from outside the bathrooms. Two lines form outside the bathrooms. One by one, Miss Bimp's students come out, sweaters over bare chests, shoes with no socks, jumpers with no shirts beneath. I watch from a distance as they hand Piper their clothes and their money. Please, Piper, I can't take off my dress. Can't I bring something tomorrow? Penelope begs Piper. I'm sorry, Piper explains. She rolls her lips together and shakes her head. Our arrangements simply won't allow that kind of flexibility. She looks really sorry, too, as if she would change the rules in a second if only she could. The girl marches off to the bathroom and returns, slip in hand. Can't do it to, you know, personal, Piper tells the girl, whose face is now as red as her hair. At the end of the day, I see two eighth grade guys walking home bare-chested, shivering in the gray, foggy afternoon. Piper limited her sales efforts to the seventh grade class, but probably they had a friend in the seventh grade send their clothes in. I'll bet Piper got twice as many eighth grade kids this way. I have to admit, Piper is pretty smart, but she's going to get in trouble for this. I just know it. All right, chapter 13, One Woman Commando Unit, Wednesday, January 9th, 1935. I hear something funny when I get up the next morning, and when I go outside, I find Piper stuffing extra clothes in our laundry bags. What are you doing? I ask her. What does it look like? You won't help. What am I supposed to do? You're just lucky that I caught you and not my mom or dad, I say, but as soon as this, come, this is out of my mouth, I'm sorry I said it. It sounds pretty lame. I'm lucky, huh? She smiles, so pleased with herself. She can hardly stand it. I guess that means you won't tell. My ears are hot. I feel big and stupid, and I don't know what to say, so I go back inside, hoping someone else will catch her. While I'm in the bathroom looking for my toothbrush, my mom corners me. Moose, honey, she says. I have some good news for you. She's smiling like she wants something. Things are going to change around here. My mom takes a lock of hair that's supposed to be on one side of my part and puts it on the other. Mom, I raise my eyebrows. Sometimes she needs reminding that I'm not five anymore. She smiles and nods her head as if she understands she's made a mistake, then gives me a once over. Have you grown out of your trousers? I look down at my feet, a good four inches of sock are showing. Go put your other ones on. The brown ones, my mother says. I go in my room, happy to have an excuse to put a door between us. I met with Carrie Kelly yesterday, my mother calls through the door. Oh, she says, we need to do a clean sweep, throw away Nat's button box. There'll be no more counting for her, no more obsessions. My gut tightens. I come out with the brown corduroys on. Mom, I squeeze the word out of my throat. Mrs. Kelly said we can't let ourselves get in Natalie's way. She said we're the stumbling block. If Natalie's going to change, we have to change first. I blow air out of my mouth like I'm whistling with no sound. So now it's our fault? Moose, my mother insists. You know what I mean. You only met with her once, Mom. Did she even meet Natalie? Of course. She spent all afternoon with her, my mom says. And then Natalie...
goes on about how Nat's not not supposed to count, not supposed to rock, not supposed to play with her buttons, not supposed to do anything she actually likes to do. Yes, ma'am, I say, searching the medicine cabinet for my toothbrush. Then I figure out where it is. Natalie. My mother follows me as I march into Natalie's room. Nat isn't here. My father has taken her out to the parade grounds to give my mom a break. Yep, here's the toothbrush. Natalie has stacks of buttons and perfect lines all around it like little soldiers guarding something precious. I reach for my toothbrush, but I can't make myself disturb her perfect button world. Well, actually, my mother's voice has softened. There is a Weedle in it now. I freeze my hand on Nat's door. This involves you. I've lined up some piano lessons to teach in the city. The warden is very well connected and he has he was kind enough to introduce me to a number of families who were looking for a piano teacher. We need the money, Moose. Carrie Kelly costs a small fortune and so does the Esther P. Marinoff. So I'll need you to come straight home from school. I have to be on the four o'clock boat and that is probably cutting it too close. She shakes her head and bites her bottom lip. I'm supposed to watch Natalie? Mrs. Kelly says you can take her with you wherever you go, just like any other sister. This stops me. I face my mom. Mom, nobody takes his sister with him everywhere he goes. My mom's shoulders hunch down and a little excitement drains out of her face. Well, they could, she says. I stare at her, suspicious now. What do you mean, wherever I go? I ask, waving the tooth powder at her. Wherever you go. Mom, it's dangerous. You're the only one who's always telling me how. That's what I mean. My mother is all excited again. I am back in the bathroom, mixing the tooth powder and water in the palm of my hand. My mom has followed me. Her eyes are shining, and she's smiling at the end of every sentence. That's what's changing. Mrs. Kelly says this is just what Natalie needs. We need to help Natalie join the human race. Mom, I brush my teeth with my finger. We live on an island with 278 murderers, kidnappers, thieves. Maybe this isn't the exact part of the human race we want her to join. Funny you should mention this because I was talking to B. Trixel about this yesterday, and you know what she said? She said we are so lucky to live here because Alcatraz is a lot safer than any neighborhood in San Francisco. She says she never locks her door. She never has to. Our bad guys are all locked up. You know your dad's always saying the ratio of inmate to guard is 3 to 1 here compared to 10 to 1 at Saint Qu San Quentin, which makes Alcatraz a much safer prison. And in the city? Oh great, I mutter as I make a cup with my hands and run water into it, then rinse the tooth powder out of my mouth. It's safer than San Quentin, the second worst prison in the state. And in the city, my mother says this louder, as if to drown out my comment. B. Trixel says those same criminals are out free. Does the warden even know Natalie's here, or does he still think she's at the SRP Marinoff? Of course he knows, Moose, but that doesn't mean I want you to parade her around in front of him. I won't lie to you. He isn't wild about the idea of her living here. Then she should stay inside. Don't be silly. You don't need to hide. Go about your business like you would if Nat wasn't with you. Just don't go looking for the warden, all right? Natalie doesn't know how to swim, Mom. What if she falls in? Well, we do have to be careful of that, but I don't want you near the water either. Anything that's not safe for Natalie is not safe for you. So if you really think it's so dangerous here, Moose, then we should move back home. Good idea, I say, my voice low and hard. Moose, my mother's eyes are like the, lit, like the lit end of a cigarette burning into me. Then I remember, baseball. You don't really mean every day. Yes, I do. Well, I can't Monday. I'm playing ball after school, she sighs. I have lessons scheduled for Monday, Moose, but I have nothing for Tuesday. What do you say I try to keep that day free for you? Monday is when they play, Mom, not Tuesday, Scout said. Well, ask the Scout person play on Tuesday. I hardly know the guy. How am I supposed to get him to put together a whole game just for me, I ask. Or, er, just for me. Ask him. That's how my mother says, and then softens. Look, I know this isn't easy for you. I know you'd rather not have any responsibilities, but the fact is, you do. If you play baseball in Alcatraz, you can play every day. Almost no one plays here. Graham doesn't live down the street anymore, honey. My mom sighs. We can't do this without you. Being around kids is good for Natalie. Mrs. Kelly says so. And if she's, got, if she's to get accepted in the Esther P. Marinoff, 
My mom is like a one-woman commando unit. She could win land battles, air battles, water battles, outer space battles, too, probably. I wonder if there would be time to get Natalie and then get back to school in time to play ball with the guys. It would be embarrassing to have her here, but at least I could play. Could I take her to San Francisco, I ask? No. Why not? You just said, I just said it isn't safe there. It isn't safe there, but it's safe here, crammed right up close with America's worst criminals. We've been through this already, Moose. How long will you be gone, I ask. Even when I'm here, you'll need to take her outside with you, Moose. What kind of kid? Uh, what kind of a kid experience is she going to have following me around? She can't mean this. Please, someone tell me she didn't say this. Moose. My mother reaches for my chin again and tips my face toward her. I need you. Your dad needs you, and Natalie needs you most of all. Let's give this a try, shall we? Let's just see how it goes. I pull my head away and walk toward my room. What if I don't want to see how it goes? What if I've been seeing how it goes my whole life? I whisper. Tuesday. See if Scout can play on Tuesday. Is that too much to ask? All right, so that was the end of chapters um, 12 through 13. Um, your question for today is why do you think Moose's mother treats her children the way she does? So um, why is she so focused on Natalie? Um, and why does she, especially in that last chapter I just read, why does she treat um, and talk with Moose the way that she does? So just think about that um, and put some of those details into your answer.